started with their screen sharing. And I'm also going to post a link for taking a look at captions, if that's something that would be helpful to you, as well as the download page for Chloe 7 and the Chloe Project webpage. And at this point, I will let Richard Garrett from Edge Adventures take it away. Thank you, Barbara. Good morning or good afternoon for everyone. We're delighted that you could join us for this Chloe 7 webinar, the first of two. There'll be another opportunity to hear this presentation in September, hosted by Edge Ventures. Just an introduction for anyone not familiar with Chloe. Chloe stands for the Changing Landscape of Online Education. It's a long-standing partnership between Quality Matters and Edge Ventures at Encora. And the original logic was to fill a gap. iPads began to track online enrollment, but online strategy, practices, operations, still a very disparate territory back in 2015 when the two organizations first discussed the idea of a survey to address this, this missing data, this missing perspective. Chloe has been run annually since 2016. And we're so appreciative of the time and effort that online leaders, the folks we call chief online officers, have taken over those years, not least this most recent survey, to offer their points of view, their data, their predictions about all things online learning. What we're going to do today is give you some highlights from the latest report that was published just a week ago, freely available on both the Edge Adventures website and the Quality Matters website. And that report is multifaceted, rich, covers lots of ground. We can only touch on a few themes here, but we've tried to make it as wide ranging and interesting as possible. As Barbara emphasized, please do use the Q&A and the chat to post questions to us that we will get to or comments, experiences at your institution that illuminate or, or perhaps challenge some of the perspectives that we're going to share with you today. So I'm Richard Garrett. I'm the Chief Research Officer at Edge Ventures, which is part of Encora. And you'll hear soon also from Beth Bethany Simonich, who is the Director of Research and Innovation at Quality Matters. And we're two of the we're the two co-directors and also two of the authors of the latest Chloe 7 report. So what we're gonna do is first give you a sense of the sample and then highlight the main themes that we're gonna focus on. So Chloe 7 is a survey of online leaders at colleges and universities nationwide of all shapes and sizes and all stages of online learning development and all varieties of online learning. This year, we received full or partial responses from 311 US higher education institutions. That was a little bit down from the peak in Chloe 6. And I think that's a function. Remember, this survey was conducted early in 2022. The uh, Omicron variant was very much at its peak at that time. Institutions were struggling with that coming back after the holidays. Perhaps this was one online learning survey too many. And we will see how the response trend is going forward. But nonetheless, this is a rich, robust, representative sample. And again, we're so appreciative of everyone who took the time to complete this survey. The survey breaks down by sector over there on the left, very similar to prior years. About a third of the sample is public two-year institutions, community colleges by and large, about 30% are from four-year public institutions, and then the same ratio four-year private nonprofit institutions. And then that 5% is largely for-profit institutions and a handful of other categories. So broadly representative our for-profit response is always underrepresented. That's always been a challenge for Chloe over time, but over the years, the for-profits significance in online has gone down and the significance of non-profits of all shapes and sizes has gone up. So that for-profit relative absence has become less and less of an issue. Although we would welcome for-profit respondents going forward. 
We also break the sample down into size of online enrollment. And by online enrollment, we mean students taking either full courses or full programs online. And we have this three part categorization institutions with more than 7,500 online students by that definition, that's 5% of our sample this year, those between 1,000 and 7,500, that's 46%, and then institutions with fewer than 1,000 fully online students. Again, a nice representative sample of the spread of online activity across US higher education today and coming out of the pandemic. And then by Carnegie classification, again, a nice array between associate, baccalaureate, masters, doctoral, and uh, specialized institutions. So we're going to kick off with the first section. We've got four themes to discuss with you. The first I'm going to talk, at, talk about, which is student demand for online from the point of view of chief online officers and their sense of trends around modality and looking ahead. Bethany's then going to talk about faculty development, concern with online learning. I'm going to talk about online student services. And then Bethany's going to close out with uh, some questions about online learning and quality assurance. And there'll be a handful of polls that we're going to post to you as well, just to get your live take on some of the themes and questions that emerge from this year's closed survey. So naturally, coming out of the pandemic, one thing on our minds, on everyone's minds, is how has that experience shaped students' perceptions of the appeal, the draw of online learning, not forced to do online because of a pandemic, but in normal circumstances post pandemic, what's their take? Are they more interested? Are they less interested? And we asked online leaders to think about this question from three different points of view. The first traditional age undergrads, then adult undergrads, and then grad students. And we had this spread of options between is in their view, these students at their institution, is their view of online learning, their interest in online learning, much lower than it was pre-pandemic, a little bit lower, about the same, a bit higher and much higher. And you can clearly see that the typical online learner, the vast majority of uh, online leaders think that the stock of online has gone up. Almost half think it has gone up much higher, more than 20% in, in rough terms compared to the pre-pandemic baseline. And then the next largest, ratios think it's gone up somewhat. A few think it's unchanged and very, very few think on balance that students of all varieties have less interest in online. Not to say that they don't recognize online's weaknesses as well as strengths or where it may fit better or, or less well, but in the view of these online leaders, they think there's been a significant increase in positive interest in online learning over the last couple of years. So with that in mind, we then said, well, looking ahead a few years out to 2025, what do chief online officers think that the typical modality will be at their institution for again, the same three different types of students, traditional age undergrad, adult undergrad and graduate student. And this was the these were the results that really surprised us. We would have expected, yes, to see a prediction of more online, more hybrid, but we didn't expect it to be quite so dramatic a predicted change as you see laid out here. Almost no chief online officers, despite the wide variety of institutions and starting points they represent, based on that sample slide that we just went through, despite that range, almost no chief online officers imagined that the typical student experience, even for traditional age undergrads at their institution, will be characterized essentially by the legacy physical campus with little or no role online. It's certainly true that there were some differences by student type. The view for traditional age undergrads, the prediction is that some kind of hybrid, whether that's majority campus, some online, or a balance between online and on campus, will be the norm in just three years time. When it came to adult undergrads and grad students, the responses were almost identical. But what is interesting there in our view is that it wasn't a rush to say fully online is gonna be the norm. There was also this 
preference, this sense that some kind of hybrid more towards the right-hand side of this chart, majority online, some campus, or a balance between the two, but relatively few chief online officers think that fully online with little or no campus engagement will be the norm for these busy working adults, whether they're undergrad or graduate students. So we were very struck by this finding insofar as certainly compared to the pre-pandemic baseline and even now coming out of COVID and accepting that definitions exactly what, what does some online mean, what does balance mean, these things still need to be worked out and clarified. But we would argue that there's still quite a big gap between what the typical, say, traditional undergraduate student experience is like in 2022 versus the idea that 40% of such students by 2025 would have a genuine balance between online learning and a physical campus. And equally for adult learners and graduate students, particularly for graduate students, there's already a much higher proportion arguably taking fully online programs today. And chief online officers think there's gonna be somewhat of a modification to emphasize hybrid, perhaps in the interest of differentiation in a crowded market or fields moving online that would struggle to offer a fully online program or a, a sense of a stronger regional emphasis to markets where your student body is more and more within a certain driving distance. We know that's been trending in that direction over the years anyway, and that would allow for judicious amount of on-campus or otherwise in-person programming that might make it more tangible, more relevant, more distinguished, more differentiated. We'll see how this plays out, but a very striking prediction in the not too distant future. And then that text box, we were struck by the fact that community colleges were actually least likely to predict, to predict fully or majority online learning. And did that reflect hard one experience to say that fully online might be appealing from a convenience point of view, but may not be the best fit, particularly for less experienced students at such schools. So we're gonna ask you our first polling question and my colleagues are gonna bring up the poll. The question is, what does this word hybrid mean? Why do schools engage in hybrid? What are the drivers here? So the question is, at your institution, assuming you are moving towards hybrid, is it primarily driven by institutional identity, brand, program fundamentals? Is it more about student preference? Is it more about faculty preference? Is it a balance of the three or you're really not engaged in hybrid at all? So please go ahead uh, and enter your response. Barbara, I'm not seeing anything moving here. Am I supposed to be seeing something moving? There's uh, there's still some people answering, so I'm going to hold off until I share. Sorry. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we're about 72% participated, but there's still numbers climbing, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and, and end it now. We got about 77% of participants, um, so. Okay, so the results, almost half say they're juggling all three motivations. The next most important was institutional program fundamentals, which perhaps is the, should be the strongest driver depending on your point of view, but the student preference not far behind, faculty preference less visible, and very few institutions not considering hybrid at all. So interesting, appreciate your responses on that. So last slide in, in this section, we then asked online leaders to say, well, what's the alignment between this, this hybrid vision that most of them had and institutional readiness and strategy? And again, we asked them to think about that from the point of view of the three different student types. And for grad strategy, there was perceived to be the most alignment, then adult undergrads, and the biggest tension 
was for traditional age undergraduate. But even there, most institutions said, we either feel aligned or we're getting there. We're working on it. We don't perceive it as an, as an acute challenge. Fewer than 20% of schools felt that there was a real tension between notionally what students wanted and what the institution wanted or the institutional starting point or direction. So that bodes well for that hybrid vision actually being being realized in the not too distant future. So uh, Bethany, over to you. Thanks, Richard. So now we're going to turn our attention a little bit to faculty development. And Richard, you can progress to the next slide there. So Chloe Seven talked about uh, faculty development from really two different perspectives. One was faculty support, which we're going to look at right now. And the other one is faculty professional development or, or faculty training, as it's termed at some institutions. So faculty support, you can conceptualize that as all the ways that an institution really does support faculty um, you know, in, in good online learning. So even looking at that first item there, tech support for faculty, that includes both faculty professional development and training for using technology, but also campus-based resources or online-based or third-party based resources for technology help. So that's a little bit of the difference between faculty support and then straight faculty development. So you can see that one of the big takeaways this year was that institutions started to focus, as, as I would term it, on the whole student because we saw big increases uh, in student supports for mental health, but also faculty supports for supporting students with mental health needs. So that you can see as the last item here um, on, on the graph uh, in terms of what was added during the pandemic, 32% of institutions added faculty support to address student mental health issues. So I think that's phenomenal in terms of supporting that whole online student. You can also see though that many of these faculty supports were largely established prior to the pandemic. So that navy blue bar there, that's established pre-pandemic. We see strong establishment there for technology support and for most of those other items as well. Faculty support in general for online teaching, ID support, making online courses accessible, uh, training and engaging students is, you know, this is where we start to see some of those more niche support topics, engaging students, quality assurance standards that accessibility. So we see those numbers for added during the pandemic increase just slightly. But again, what this is painting a picture of is that a lot of institutions had these faculty supports established pre-pandemic, even if they built on them. But we do see this notable change now in faculty support for student mental health issues. Next slide, Richard, please. So turning our attention now to faculty development priorities. So we asked COOs to really look forward um, and tell us what are you concentrating on? What are some of your highest priorities moving forward for faculty development? So you can see here that, um, you know, things that are really focusing on that good online experience for the students, they are still, you know, leading the, the, the pack here in terms of priority, faculty access to instructional design expertise, as well as faculty PD for designing online courses, which is, you know, in the fifth bar there. Um, but if you look at, at, you know, if we combine highest priority and high priority to just look in general at those priority items, those that ranked 50% and above was really everything except for accessibility and technology. And you can see that both for accessibility and technology, you see more institutions there saying that we are going to maintain the services that we had. So again, you know, we see this picture of there are these institutional supports that are helping, you know, faculty, especially with things maybe that are not as related to the teaching of the course, the design, the pedagogy of the course, but making courses and digital materials accessible and also those technology related um, uh, developments and supports really in a pattern of maintenance there. But you know, it was somewhat surprising, especially given all of the intense investment that we saw during the pandemic in faculty professional development, the huge increases there that we are still seeing COOs report um, that a very near my uh, majority are saying still a high priority for instructional design and supporting faculty with designing and teaching online courses, also applying quality assurance standards. So as Richard mentioned, we're going to close out the presentation with that. So I will come back to that as well. Richard, back to you. Thanks, Bethany. So we're now going to show some data about 
online learning services, how they're organized within institutions, and also some data on numbers of specialized online learning staff, such as instructional designers. So the first chart we're going to talk about is data on the relative centralization of particular online student services at institutions. And this is a question we asked back in Chloe for pre-pandemic. So we have a nice uh, pre-pandemic baseline for this data. So we asked institutions to select the option that best characterized how this particular service for online students is organized between at one extreme fully centralized on the left hand side of the chart through to fully distributed across schools, colleges, departments on the other end, and then also a not applicable option in case that particular service really wasn't offered at all. But that was very much the exception. And this chart is ordered from top to bottom from the least centralized online service through to the most centralized online learning service. And one thing you can see is that the typical institution is more centralized than not when it comes to almost all of these services uh, with the exception of the first couple. And I think that's indicative of the relative maturity of online learning over the last two or three decades at many institutions that tends to move online from a bottom up somewhat disparate random activity, different faculty involved, others not, different schools involved, others not, to something that's somewhat more institutionalized and therefore centralized. And I think institutions also realizing the benefits of economies of scale, consistency, simplified resourcing that tends to lend itself to a more centralized activity. But equally, you see many institutions say we're not completely centralized. There may be differences that matter by discipline, by department. Different online learning arrangements grew up in semi-isolation over time and may still make sense or there's just a legacy way of doing things. There's also some services where centralization really isn't the typical arrangement. And it tends to be services that are more about faculty or course program design or related to academics in some sense. So you see faculty recruitment is the least centralized service that naturally lends itself to a more bottom up department by department endeavor. Equally, designing courses and programs is almost balanced between centralized quality assurance, templates and processes versus discipline driven, faculty driven decisions around courses and programs. And then tutoring, coaching, mentoring, advising, again, sort of straddling that mix of a central service versus something that is characterized by academic specificity at local level. Then the next clustering, you've got things that are a bit of a hybrid between centralization and decentralization. Program marketing, it has that program specific element which favors decentralization perhaps, but marketing, everyone knows that's a particular skill set. Most schools have limited resources. There can be all kinds of advantages in pooling those resources and marketing across a portfolio rather than program by program or department by department. Same on market research different needs at different times may favor decentralization but to have say a go-to third party or a contract that spans lots and lots of online activity may simply prove more cost effective and uh, more effective in terms of getting value from the result on the other end of the spectrum you have financial aid heavily regulated institutions already set up typically highly centralized to manage financial aid. Generally, online learning typically falls under that if we're talking about credit bearing activity. Too much regulatory risk, I think, to, to mess with that equation. And then you have some things like help desk, non-academic, non-sensitive, uh, sometimes outsourced, 
also naturally lends itself to greater centralization. And then equally accessibility, ADA compliance, strong regulatory dimension and does encroach on local decisions about course and program design, but is also a, a matter that lends itself to institutional consistency on how things are done. Now, when we compared the Chloe 7 results to those from Chloe 4 uh, three years earlier, we definitely saw evidence of greater centralization over time in a number of fields like help desk, proctoring, marketing, and recruitment. But we also saw instances of greater decentralization over time. So this sense of everything is just becoming more centralized is true up to a point, but there are exceptions and they tended to be the more academically oriented services such as tutoring and faculty recruitment. So we'll continue to monitor this centralization trend uh, in future years. A related question pertains to the relative integration of online student services. And what that means is, are institutions operating separate services for online students, or are they offering the same service to all students, regardless of modality? Same sort of range between fully integrated and fully separate, left to right. And the chart is again organized from the least integrated service at the top, course and program design, to the most integrated service, again, financial aid. So on balance, just as most services lean centralized, most services also lean integrated. Same maturation variable there, institutions finding all kinds of efficiencies and effectiveness from integrating something. Many students move back and forth between modalities or are increasingly hybrid, so it may make less sense to have separate services by delivery mode, but there are still definitely a significant minority of institutions for a number of these services that maintain some sort of balance between integration and separation, or still treat online students as distinct with distinct needs. Perhaps these are institutions that are perhaps very campus oriented, very focused on traditional age undergrads and have a bolt-on almost online division focused on say undergrads who are adults or graduate students. Very different activity, very different market for that school and separate services may make sense. But we definitely found with scale, integration tends to increase. And we would expect the integration fully or mostly to continue to increase over time. And we found when, when comparing to Chloe 4 that all these services have become more integrated over time. The biggest gainers on that front were proctoring, tutoring, accessibility, help desk, and marketing. The things, again, that most benefit from centralization, arguably, and are least sensitive at the faculty or departmental level. And then the third complementary perspective that we asked about, and we hadn't asked this question before in Chloe, was the extent to which any of these services were outsourced to third party organizations of one kind or another. It's a, always a big topic in the media, the valuable role of outsourcing, also concerns about outsourcing. So here the options were, is this service at your institution completely outsourced, primarily outsourced? Is it a balance between in-house and external resources or is it delivered mostly in-house or completely in-house? And here it's arranged again from least outsourced to most outsourced. And perhaps contrary to some of the media coverage, online leaders tell us that the typical arrangement is that everything is done in-house. And if it's not completely done in-house, then it's primarily done in-house. The institutions that even attribute half of their operations when it comes to a particular service to a third party, unusual. And those that go beyond that, say it's primarily outsourced or completely outsourced, are very much in the minority. And I think what we have to wonder is whether is online learning now at a level of maturity where most institutions see it as core business and therefore they're the ones who should be operating these services. They may outsource discrete activities where perhaps they lack certain technologies, certain expertise, they may see that third party support as a catalyst to 
help them get their act together internally, and then they bring that function in house. So you could say this is already perhaps the high watermark, or maybe we've even passed the high watermark of outsourcing for online learning, given how developed online learning has become and accelerated by the pandemic. Or you might say, given how important online learning is becoming, given how crowded the market is, given that there's always going to be cutting edge technology, new approaches to services, institutions may struggle with economies of scale, they may not be able to recruit enough staff or pay those staff what they might be able to get in the private sector. Therefore, service level may suffer, that may mean a weaker student experience, weaker recruitment, et cetera, et cetera. There may still actually be a stronger rationale for selective outsourcing going forward if it allows an institution to get ahead of the game, uh, cut through the noise in the market, stand out in a very crowded commoditized space and say, because we partner with a specialist organization, we can go above and beyond in the efficiency and effectiveness of a particular service. So we will monitor this question going forward and seeing how things are going to trend. Another angle on outsourcing is this slide. So we asked some questions about, okay, if you are outsourcing a particular service, what's the nature of the contract? Again, a lot of media debate, particularly around OPM, between the pros and cons of a revenue share model versus a more conventional fee for service model. And we broke out a number of functions and asked online leaders, do you outsource this at all? Which would be the, the final column on the right. And then if you do outsource it, is it fee for service or is it rev share? And then the additional ratios in brackets those refer to institutions that say, yes, they outsource, but they have more than one outsourced partner. So just to explain, to take, say, market research, that was the function most commonly outsourced, according to 1207. More than a third of institutions said they did outsource at least a portion of their market research relating to online learning. The typical arrangement was fee for service, 31% of that 36%, so almost all of that 36% said that it was some sort of fee-for-service arrangement, and only 5% said it was some sort of revenue share, likely part of, a, of an OPM bundle. Compared to, say, at the bottom, student advising or retention, only 12% of schools said that they outsourced that at all, and that was more of a balance between fee-for-service and revenue share. And it was unusual for any school to say they had more than one outsourcing partner. And then I'll also comment on the OPM bundle. So that's the, the classic notion of an OPM that is, say, offering a school marketing and recruitment and student support services, perhaps help desk, uh, perhaps other services like, like placement or uh, regulatory support. And we found they're pretty consistent with the prior Chloe survey. About 18% of schools said, yes, we do have an OPM relationship. And this was the only type of outsourcing where a revenue share was more common than fee-for-service. Certainly our OPM research and EduVentures suggests that fee-for-service is becoming far more mainstream, perhaps because schools are getting more comfortable with different aspects of online learning services, but still feel the need for support from a specialist third party in, in discrete areas. So these, the fee-for-service ratio may catch up uh, with the rev share over time. And perhaps the OPM ratio itself will grow. The question I think will be the one I've kept referring to is, is online learning becoming core business to the extent that outsourcing will become somewhat rarer, uh, more specialized, uh, more strategic, or because of a crowded commoditized market, will schools actually feel the need to turn to third parties more often? Because without that, they're increasingly uh, lost in the crowd and online learning is not bringing in the enrollment and the revenue that they need. So final theme for my uh, section before I hand back to Bethany for the final section on uh, online quality assurance. For the first time in Chloe 7, we asked online leaders to report the number of specialist staff pertaining to online learning at their institutions. And we broke out three different types of staff. Instructional designers, that I think everyone understands what that means. 
And then we had this category of educational technologists. There isn't really a agreed term for this, but these are folks who specialize in the hardware, the software that goes into an online learning infrastructure. And then advisors would be people who support students. They might be termed uh, advisors, mentors, coaches, support staff. There might be an academic bent to what they do. There might be more of a help desk bent to what they do. You know, again, pretty hard to, to pin down and, and use exact terminology. But we just wanted to get a feel for what was the pre-pandemic baseline, what had happened by the time Chloe 7 survey came around. And we then calculated in the chart a rough ratio of online students to specialist online staff. So let me start with the table on the right here. So back in 2019, online leaders told us that when it came to instructional designers, that 87% said, yes, they did employ instructional designers, but the median number of instructional designers was only two for the entire institution. And that was FTEs. And then by fall 2021, 94% said they did employ at least one instructional designer and the median had gone up to three. So still a low number, but that's a 50% increase in just two years. And that is consistent with the stresses and strains of the pandemic and institutions having to, in short order, subtly stand up lots of remote slash online courses in a very short space of time. But still in terms of specialized staff dedicated to instructional design when it comes to online learning, the typical institution had few, uh, although I'll show you on the chart the, the array depending on the type of institution. When it came to educational technologists, pretty similar ratios of having any, and then two and two, it didn't evolve as uh, quickly, perhaps more economies of scale for those staff uh, versus instructional design staff or easier to adapt existing capabilities uh, to new challenges. And then advisors, we saw far higher numbers, if actually lower employment ratios in the first place. And then we saw about a 20% increase over the course of the pandemic. Now, the chart gives you some feel for the range here. So essentially, the higher the coordinate on the chart, the more online students per online learning staff specialists. So for example, for public two-year institutions, the red line, by our calculation, they had over 1,700 online students per educational technologist and about 1,100 online students per instructional designer, and then a little over 400 uh, advisors per online student. So community colleges, often least well-resourced in terms of staff and, and uh, financial resources, getting by with the least uh, ratio there or the highest ratio there. But then interestingly, the largest institutions, those that had the most online students at course and program level, exhibited a similar series of coordinates, suggesting some perhaps economies of scale, a certain way of doing things, established processes that allowed those institutions to operate with such high ratios. So that's an interesting perspective that it's not simply in order to grow, you need a certain number of online learning specialists. In fact, you can sustain, at least based on the experience of these institutions, pretty high ratios, particularly for educational technologists, then instructional designers, and then arguably the most person intensive interpersonal type of specialist, the advisors, that was where we saw the highest uh, number of employees uh, relative to online students. And then at the other extreme, the smallest institutions exhibited the least economies of scale. Uh, they actually had the most specialists per student. And perhaps what this chart is saying is that that's not sustainable over time. You either can't afford to maintain those kind of ratios or you just can't recruit and, and, and retain those specialists given the, the, the competitive market. And therefore you need to find economies of scale in order to grow that online enrollment 
without that underpinning support uh, somehow proving inadequate. What we did find, and I'm not going to show you a chart on it, but you can see it in the Chloe report, is that the typical chief online officer did express concern about the relative adequacy of the numbers of the specialist staff at their institution today and going forward, given this projection of more and more hybrid norm for everyone that chances are is gonna mean a need for more specialist assistance, but are our schools gonna be able to recruit more? Is that necessarily the right answer? So with that in mind, our, our second poll, we wanted to get your take at your institution how is your institution approaching the challenge of recruiting and retaining these kinds of specialist staff like instructional designers, educational technologists? So select all that apply. Are you improving pay and conditions? Are you using more templates and automation in order to increase economies of scale? Or are you trying to make faculty and instructors more self-sufficient? They don't need these specialist staff to the same extent. So go ahead and uh, offer your perspective from your institution. All right, so Richard, I'm gonna give this about a minute again, just to sort of get answers in and then I'll share the results. Great. Okay, I think we're just allowing the last few responses to come in. All right, so we're about 65% participated. Looks like we're slowing down. Yeah, whenever you whenever you're ready. All right, I'll go ahead and end it and share. Okay, interesting results. So the most common response, 73% of you said you're emphasizing ways to make faculty and instructors more self-sufficient. And I think that's consistent with online as ever more normal and mainstream, and perhaps faculty becoming comfortable with, with course design and, and needing less hand-holding. The second most common response was let's template things, Let's try and automate where it makes sense, 44%. And then perhaps not surprisingly, the least common response was, we're just gonna pay more. We're gonna improve our, our terms and conditions, 30%, uh, not insignificant, but uh, definitely in third place. So I think that's, that's probably a pretty accurate overview. The goal is let's, let's make do more with less, let's spread skills, let's mainstream capabilities. And yes, use these specialist staff where essential, but uh, we know we can't rely on them to the same extent as perhaps was the case in the past. So appreciate your responses on that. So uh, Bethany, back to you for the last section. Thanks, Richard. So we're going to close it out with talking about quality assurance. This was also um, you know, a very notable uh, section in Chloe 7 this year, and I think a lot of interest uh, around the results. So let's dive in, Richard, if you want to advance to the first slide, please. So, you know, again, I encourage you to read the full report because we did uh, investigate uh, lots of different aspects for quality assurance, but we're going to start out in the, in the presentation here by looking at two different things. The source of adopted quality assurance standards. So we asked chief online officers in terms of the quality assurance standards that you have for online courses. So we're not yet talking about online programs, but just for those online courses did your institution uh, develop them from within? Is this uh, a set of standards perhaps that you sourced from a, a third party or an external party, or is it a combination of the two? So first we were looking at where those sources uh, of the standards were, and we broke it down by institutional type. So you can see there that by and large, your large online enrollment institutions, and this does not necessarily mean large enrollment institutions, these mean institutions that have a large online enrollment. So, you know, as, as, a, as a number and a, and a percentage. So 
you can see that internally, 89% uh, of those institutions sourced those quality standards from within the institution. Much different picture when we're looking at mid-size or low online enrollment. That drops to about half of those institutions. We, and we see a lot more of we're sourcing them externally or we're using a combination of external and internal standards. We also asked about when those standards are evaluated. So, you know, this really speaks to that true quality assurance picture that these institutions have standards. You know, again, you can see that a lot of them are created by and from within the institution. And so we asked, are you evaluating when these standards are met? And if so, when? Um, so again, we broke it down by institutional type. And you can see that it's those large online enrollment institutions, only 30% of the time do they always evaluate their online courses using their institutional quality assurance standards. So only about a third of the time. Very similar picture for mid-sized online institutions. And that bumps up to uh, a majority for low online enrollment institutions. 54% of low online enrollment institutions do evaluate courses using their quality assurance standards always. Uh, and then, you know, from there we see the differences really start to play out voluntary by department or program or voluntary by instructor, right? So even if an institution, and, and you know, let's again return to large online enrollment institutions here for a moment, even if they're saying, no, we don't always certify or assure the quality of our online courses based on our standards, there are still options that those courses are going through those reviews when you're looking at voluntary by department or voluntary by instructor. So even in a voluntary system, you still do have uh, some course reviews. But this really did start to paint a picture, though, that quality assurance is important to institutions, especially uh, quality assurance in online learning, and that they have adopted these standards. Very few have no standards adopted. 5% um, or less across the board. But in terms of assuring quality, most of the institutions may not be there yet. Uh, as, as probably everybody who is you know, attending this presentation knows, it's not always an easy process to figure out and quality assurance uh, doesn't always mean one single thing. So looking at those large online enrollment, we may be seeing barriers of it's simply difficult to um, evaluate that many online courses. So it may be a, you know, a, a issue of numbers, staffing, training, uh, and other issues related to budget as well. Next slide, please, Richard. Now, looking at it in terms of modality, um, here's where we really fleshed out the, the, the quality assurance uh, avenues and standards by the different online modalities. This was also the first year that we included face-to-face -face courses in this question set. Um, and for those of you that filled out the CLOE report, first of all, thank you very, very much. But you also know that we defined all of these modalities before we asked you to answer questions about them. And that also harkens back to some of the comments that I saw in the chat that several of these uh, you know, may have different definitions depending on the institution. What is hybrid at one institution may not equal hybrid at another institution. So know that we did set out definitions prior to this question. So we asked about online asynchronous courses, online synchronous hybrid courses, multimodal courses that would include high flex courses, and then face-to-face -face courses. And you know you can see the options there. All courses in this modality are required to meet standards, or it's optional by department or faculty, or it's a situation where no quality standards are required to be met. You can see that online asynchronous has the highest percentage of required quality assurance there. 50% of online asynchronous courses, chief online officers reported are required to meet standards at all times. And then of course, you still have that voluntary picture being painted as well, but it decreases from there in terms of modality. About a quarter of hybrid, a little less 21% for multimodal, and a very, very sharp decline there for face-to-face -face courses. So I think what, what this graph speaks to and what these results speak to as well is also the tensions between doing, tensions and differences between doing quality assurance for online learning versus quality assurance for that campus-based learning. So if an institution has, you know, that, that uh, common practice of faculty peer review for their face-to-face -face courses, 
assuring quality for online courses can be very different. And you also need to look at things like the accessibility of the digital materials, the organization, the navigation, and, and the layout, uh, and supporting online students. And a lot of those things are, are extra and additional and things that institutions either need to create or, or outsource. But again, it's it started to, to strengthen this picture of optional compliance for quality assurance standards. So again, institutions are clearly interested in uh, delivering quality educational experiences to their online students. They're adopting standards, they're using standards, they may not have matured to the point where they are able to really assure uh, that the, their institutional standards have been met, though. Next slide, please, Richard. So we're going to um, launch into two polls here. The first one asks about the scenario that best represents your institution and the ways that you are communicating your online quality assurance efforts to prospective students. So looking at quality assurance through the lens of how it might help in, in things like marketing and enrollment and really attracting prospective students uh, to your institution. So Rico, if you would go ahead and launch that. All right, it's out this way. Thanks. And as I wait for everybody to weigh in on that, I am going to attend to a question in the chat. So Amari asked a really good question. How do you evaluate face-to-face -face courses by national quality standards? Here's a good, good um, uh, avenue to emphasize that most institutions develop their quality assurance standards either internally or as a combination of internal and external standards. So again, for those face-to-face -face courses, the quality standards may very well just be from within the institution. They may not be benchmarking to national quality standards. Bethany, I know we're getting short on time too. So if you want me just to go ahead and share. Yes, now, I yes. Can. yeah, okay. that's a good idea. Thanks, yeah. Rico. Appreciate yeah. it. Okay. So it looks as though, uh, you know, by and large, but not a majority, 44%, you mostly do not communicate your online quality assurance efforts and marketing to your students. Um, secondly, a lot of you are saying we don't do this enough, but it is something that is on your radar. Um, and then that that falls down to some of you are doing this already. So that does fall in line with, with I think, the pathway that the data is telling us as well, that we saw, again, a lot of pandemic investments in preparing and supporting faculty for quality online. And I think now we see the attention turning to delivering a better educational online experience. And I do think that that will eventually turn into the various ways that we can talk about and communicate quality assurance to our students. So Rico, let's go ahead and close this out um, and launch the next one, if you would, please. And that's in tandem to, to this one. Okay, so this poll question, um, you know, we we really tried to give you some examples in the options here for different ways that institutions can talk about quality assurance and can communicate quality assurance. I think part of the conversation as well needs to move us beyond this idea of standards, right? It is much less about the standards as it is, you know, again, from the institution, um, as it is about delivering a quality educational experience and really looking at the student holistically. So there are all these different aspects that I think institutions can discuss with prospective students, all the great ways that you are supporting faculty in, in effective online teaching and quality design. Um, so again, I don't think that the conversation needs to be limited just to standards. And uh, Rico, if you wanted to go ahead and, and close this out, because I, I know we're short on time, but Hopefully, at least this is sparking some thoughts for all of you for ways that you really can communicate all of these efforts uh, that are going on in your campus. Uh, okay, so what will be the focus of that communication moving forward? 66% of you are saying institutional supports for online students. I love that. And, it, you know, Chloe echoes that as well. We've seen investments in supporting the online students with uh, increases in student orientations, for example, 60% faculty excellence training experience for online teaching and learning. And that definitely corresponds, again, with all those investments that, that campuses have made in, in online teaching and faculty professional development. 
And then hovering around the 40% mark, use of quality standards and certification of program quality. Okay, thanks so much, Rico. So very interesting. We're going to close this out with that lead into program quality. So we have one more graph that we want to look at. So the, the pr previous questions all dealt with quality assurance for online courses. We then had a set of questions that um, were directed strictly to online programs. So in terms of whether or not that online program quality assurance, um, is it internal, external? Largely, it is an internal effort. And we asked about planned increases, um, you know, things that are currently in place and then planned increases by 2022. So you can see there that a lot of things that were currently in place, faculty development for program quality assurance, almost 60% of, of COOs reported that that is something that's in place. Internal evaluation is in place. So we did ask both about internal evaluation and external evaluation. So the story is really about evaluation in general, not just external. About 60% are already internally evaluating or have some means to those online programs. 56%, so again, uh, a majority there do have standards that are created by the institution. They're not yet perhaps doing benchmarking or looking at external standards. And then it kind of drops from there in terms of communicating those QA efforts to, to stakeholders. So in terms of uh, what is planned, you know, by and large, we don't see big increases planned for 2022 for online program quality. You see, though, that communicating quality assurance efforts to stakeholders, um, you know, 23 percent, that's a standout, as well as highlighting those quality assurance efforts to prospective students, hence the previous poll. That's a little bit of a standout there at, at 21 percent. So we see a little bit of a different picture here for online programs and online degree programs than we do for online courses. And again, they really may be serving two different student demographics, going back to, to Richard's graph about traditional age undergraduates versus maybe those returning adult students or those graduate students that really need the, the flexibility of online in order to uh, continue their learning or get an advanced degree. So with that, and with two minutes to spare, uh, we're going to close that out. We'd like to thank our sponsors as well, our platinum sponsors this year, iDesign, Six Red Marbles and Everspring, thank you so much. And our wonderful gold sponsors, NC Sarah and OLC Online Learning Consortium, thank you. Uh, Richard, thank you so much. And uh, let's see if we have any questions that maybe we could uh, attend to before we close things out. I know that uh, you and Eric both have been attending to the chat and Barbara has as well. So Barbara, are there any outstanding questions maybe that Richard and I could uh, answer? And Eric, if you wanted to unmike and and answer some questions as well, please do join us. Eric Fredrickson, he's also okay. a contributor and a writer to uh, the Chloe Report. Yeah, um, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, several of them are from Bethany Scharschmidt. Um, her first question was, how does the relative centralization of online student services differ from those for traditional on-campus students? That's a good question. And we haven't trapped that directly. I imagine you'd find a lot of commonality just based on the same more academic, less academic distinctions uh, that we saw earlier, but with online being at many schools still relatively novel, and that may lend itself to either, depending on the circumstances, more centralization or less centralization. So I don't know that the we have a good baseline for higher ed in general, but I would say there's probably more more commonality than, than difference. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll write another one from Bethany. Can you give an example of outsourced student advising? Well, these would be companies say like Inside Track uh, or Civitas that a part of what they do is employ advisor specialists to take on that role. And, and it can be everything from pre-enrollment to post-enrollment, but they specialize in having a pool of trained, capable staff who can either offer expertise 
that the institution doesn't have or scale or timeliness that they don't have. There aren't that many companies that specialize in it. I think partly because it's very labor intensive, human intensive. It's hard to automate and, and drive 100% consistency. But nonetheless, we know that sometimes those relationships make or break uh, a student's trajectory and you can't just rely on chatbots or, or, or whatever it is uh, to, to make these things happen. So I think that, that that need for specialized human support and intervention will endure and and companies will look for ways to to go above and beyond what an institution might be able to do on their own. And and just to add to that, Richard, I know that that some institutions also outsource some of the student advising, namely for fully online degree programs, while keeping the remainder of their student advising in house. So it could be that right. you know you you may have contracted you know with an OPM that's both helping with the the design of an online program as well as recruiting as well as advising. So you know sometimes those things are, are packaged together as well. Right. Very true. Um, Melissa asks, is the online learning staff data available compared to faculty numbers? Our e-learning staff interact support faculty more than students, and we support all faculty, not just those teaching online courses. I think that's a very good question and a very good point, Melissa. Um, Richard, as far as I know, we don't have the faculty numbers. So, um, e you know, even when we look at, um, you know, other types of numbers, you know, we're, we're largely pulling that data, uh, you know, in from other sources. And and this also and, and and Richard, hopefully you can weigh in here again in in a minute. This also I think points though to the complexity of the Chloe survey and why sometimes it is longer and it takes time to fill out. Um, if we asked COOs to fill out all this information, how many of your faculty are teaching online? How many you know all of these types of things? Um, that would greatly lengthen uh, the amount of, of data that they have to gather, and they they already are spending time gathering data, which we very much appreciate. But Richard, do we have any of those faculty numbers, or is it something that Chloe has looked at in the past as well? No, there's very there's very little data there from us or or others on any kind of you know consistent longitudinal basis. And and we did acknowledge in the report that most of these specialists don't just serve online students or, or online faculty there's increasingly blurred lines across across institutions so trying to isolate you know who exactly do they serve those ratios arguably are even higher at, at mixed mode institutions where there aren't a whole nother collection of specialists serving campus-based students say or campus-based faculty so this is, I think, that what's interesting about the online variable in general is it is it a, is it a distinct line of activity, or right. is it increasingly part of a of a messy hybrid mainstream? And I think it, both can be true depending on the institution or the program. But it's a it's an ongoing. It's what makes this territory so interesting. But it's an ongoing challenge to surveys like yeah. Chloe to say how do we frame things in a way that matches the often blended nature of of institutional reality. Absolutely. And I think if the data that that we're looking at in terms of, you know, COO, um, uh, you know, future forecasting is going to come to pass that we will see more of a merged type of campus experience, much less of this binary between face to face and online when it comes both to types of courses and modalities, but also staffing. So, Melissa, I would expect that going forward, you're going to see a lot more of a particular staff or office serving faculty or students, regardless of whether they're campus-based or, or online. I think many CTL centers have already transitioned there uh, due to the pandemic. Um, and I think we may see instructional designers uh, helping more, for example, with face-to-face uh, -face based classes as well, or web enhanced. Um, all right, another question, why doesn't the Chloe survey address NC Sarah membership? Uh, to my knowledge, I'm not sure that that's something that Chloe has ever looked at. Uh, Richard, you've been here from the beginning. I have not. So you have much more of the history there. Um, but, you know, that may be a theme that we could uh, look at moving forward that, you know, themes are around um, compliance and reciprocity and, and whatnot. So, Bethany, if there were if there were particular aspects um, of that, that that you would like to see Chloe investigate uh, in future surveys, uh, please go ahead and, and add to your uh, your question by typing in the chat, or you could also email us at research at qualitymatters.org. Um, and with that, also, I'm going to make a plug for the feedback survey. Barbara, if you want to pop that in the chat one more time, we do have a feedback survey, and 
we truly, truly appreciate you taking just a few moments of your time to fill it out. This is one of the many ways that we also hear from you about topics that you're interested in, in Chloe covering moving forward. So, um, you know, as you can probably tell from Richard and I, we could spend all day talking about data. We we really love this, this topic. We love the Chloe report, but we also want to make sure that it's useful to you and attending to topics that are important to you and part of your campus conversations as well. So please fill out this survey. It gives you an opportunity to talk about what interested you this, this year, what might, might interest you next year. Um, for any COOs that are at the presentation, thank you doubly for attending and also for, for filling out Chloe. Hopefully you will um, do the same for Chloe 8. Um, but thank you everybody for attending today and for such good questions uh, in the Q&A and the chat alike. Um, Richard, thank you so much. This, we are almost wrapping up here, Chloe Seven. So uh, thanks again, everybody. And uh, Barbara uh, mentioned that she will distribute the recording. Thank you, Thank you everyone. everyone. Have a great day. Okay. Rico, I have captured the Q&A, so we are free to end the session. Great. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so I can close it down then or no? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you.